Buonasera a tutte e a tutti. Iniziamo oggi il primo incontro del laboratorio dedicato a sensibilità, intelligenza, plasticità, mente, cervelli e macchine. Un laboratorio che si svilupperà in cinque giorni. Il primo giorno oggi abbiamo l'onore di ospitare la professoressa Caterina Malabù. E domani invece il professor Montani parlerà di immaginazione e plasticità. Mercoledì il professor Vittorio Gallese interverrà su, sul tema dalla neotenia alle pratiche sociali, esperienza, plasticità e cervello corpo. Giovedì il professor Giorgio Vallortigara terrà una relazione su come costruire un cervello sociale e concluderemo venerdì. 4 febbraio con la professoressa Luisa Damiano che ci parlerà dei robot sociali, l'ipotesi della coordinazione affettiva. Si tratta di un laboratorio di eh, ricerca e di mh, interdisciplinarità in quanto filosofi e scienziati sono chiamati a colloquiare tra loro sulle frontiere più avanzate della ricerca neurobiologica e eh, robotica. Coordinatore e eh, ideatore di questo laboratorio è il professor Pietro Montani, eh, insieme a me. Il professor Pietro Montani, che è stato professore di estetica alla Sapienza Università di Roma, ha insegnato al Centro Sperimentale di Cinematografia, sempre di Roma, e collabora, ho, ho appena finito di collaborare, con l'Università di Vilnius. Tra le sue opere alcune sono dedicate al cinema, in particolar modo alla cinematografia sovietica e agli scritti di Vertov di Eisenstein, e altri invece sono dedicati a una originale, un originale ripensamento del cantismo in vista della costruzione di una bioestetica. Tra i più recenti interventi, l'immaginazione intermediaria per illustrare, rifigurare e testimoniare il mondo visibile, tecnologie della sensibilità, estetica e immaginazione interattiva, per forme di creatività, tecnica, arte e politica ed emozioni dell'intelligenza. La parola al professor Pietro Montani, che ringrazio insieme alla professoressa Malabù, che altrettanto ringrazio della sua cortesia. Grazie Massimiliano, grazie a tutti gli amici, grazie a Caterine Malabù. I will do the presentation in Italian, Caterine, and then we will continue in English. E sono lieto davvero di, di dare il benvenuto a Caterine Malabù, che è la prima ospite del nostro laboratorio, che è in partenza domani per Chicago, dove comincerà il giorno dopo, quindi in tempi strettissimi, il suo Winter Seminar come uh, Critical Inquiry Visiting Professor presso la Chicago University, un incarico prestigioso. E il seminario <coughs> che terrà la professoressa Caterine Malabù è intitolato Philosophy and Anarchy e dunque va evidentemente collegato al, strettamente all'ultimo libro di Caterine appena uscito in Francia poche settimane fa dall'editrice dall PUF, Presse Universitaire de France, con il titolo assai inquietante O voleur punto esclamativo, anarchismo e filosofie, un grosso tomo che non sono ancora riuscito a leggere, ma lo farò prestissimo. Catherine Malabu insegna al Center for Research in Modern European Philosophy alla Kingston University vicino Londra, che appartiene all'Università di Londra, ma insegna anche a Irvine, California, insegna European Languages and Literature and Comparative Literature in questa università. 
Eh, Caterina è autrice di molti libri, ne ricorderò solo alcuni e già alcuni non possono non essere un discreto numero. Que faire de notre cerveau 2004, che è il libro eh, tradotto in italiano attraverso cui ho conosciuto l'autrice, l'autrice dei libri e non la collega che ho conosciuto più tardi, eh, Le Nouveau Blessé 2007, Ontologie de l'Accident 2009, Avant de Men e Pégenese Rationalité, un libro che mi è particolarmente caro perché è un libro kantiano, largamente kantiano, a seguire Metamorphose de l'Intelligence, che è una specie di replica al libro sul che cosa fare dei nostri cervelli, e ancora Le plaisir effacé, Clitoris e pensée del 2020, Metamorphose è del 17, e poi quello che ho appena citato, O voleur, Anarchisme e Filosofia, appena uscito. Caterine Malabou è un'autrice molto nota e molto letta in Italia e quasi tutti i libri che ho citato sono reperibili anche in traduzione italiana e ne sono reperibili anche, anche altri e non c'è bisogno che io vi dica che Caterine è una delle più originali e, influ e influenti filosofe dei nostri tempi. E mi, mi, mi limiterò invece a dire ma solo due parole perché poi avrò modo di parlare domani e quindi rinuncio alla mia introduzione generale di oggi. Eh, mi limiterò a osservare che uno dei motivi eh, di questo suo rilievo per la filosofia eh, contemporanea, uno dei motivi consiste nell'aver reso possibile e anzi io vorrei dire che per certi versi l'ha reso non più eludibile un dialogo tra la grande tradizione della filosofia continentale e qui basta fare i nomi riferirsi alle sue interpretazioni molto innovative sia di Hegel che di Kant da un lato e la biologia, le neuroscienze e anche le ricerche sull'intelligenza artificiale, appunto sui cervelli artificiali dall'altra dall parte. Caterine Malabou lavora ormai da molti anni, da una, da una quindicina di anni, a collocare, vorrei dire, degli oggetti teorici più specifici nell'area di intersezione, nello spielraum, per così dire, usando una parola cara a Walter Benjamin, che si apre tra la vita biologica e la vita simbolica. Ed è questo uno degli oggetti eh, attraverso i quali gli oggetti teorici, dicevo prima, in quest'area intermedia, in questa zona di intersezione, uno degli oggetti teorici che ha dato occasione a Caterine Malabou per un autentico corpo a corpo filosofico con il concetto della plasticità, con il, la nozione di plasticità, e che è forse un autentico filo rosso, non privo di tensioni, anzi ricco di tensioni interne, perché plasticità in Caterine Malabou è anche un concetto tematizzato a partire dal suo potere distruttivo, un filo rosso che consente di aggregare in modo motivato molti altri oggetti che occupano la riflessione di Caterine Malabou dalla questione della identità a quella del politico che assume una pregnanza particolare proprio perché è prodotto dall'interno di, di questa riflessione. E non è un caso dunque che Caterina abbia deciso di dare alla lecture che ci presenterà oggi un nuovo titolo che ora vi, vi dico e che in qualche misura non è quindi il titolo che avete letto sul programma, abbiamo avuto dei piccoli cambiamenti come avete visto, è un titolo che in qualche misura 
mi sembra lo schema, nel senso proprio kantiano della parola schema, del nostro stesso laboratorio. Il titolo sarà E Plasticity of Frontiers Between Humanities and Neuroscience and, da una parte, and Plasticity of Subjective Identities, quindi le frontiere tra le humanities e le neuroscienze, da un lato, e la plasticità delle identità soggettive, questo, queste frontiere, questi confini, are the two sides of the same issue. Sono le due facce, diciamo in italiano, le due facce della stessa medaglia. Quindi, come vedete, è proprio il territorio del nostro, del nostro seminario. Io mi fermo qui, la ringrazio ancora e passo la parola al collega Kaltenbacher che chiarirà qualcosa delle regole del gioco del, del seminario. Well, we, we carry on in English now. Um, yeah. is, uh... Uh, lecture in English, and after we have, we'll have the possibility to discuss, and we will have, uh, um, I hope, uh, a lot of questions of our, our fellows here at the Institute. And welcome again, and it's really a great pleasure to have you uh, here, uh, even just in, in a virtual forms, but uh, the next time uh, we hope we will have you personally here in Naples, and the floor is yours, please. Yeah, you must, okay. Yes, 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 yeah. Thank you so much for, for having me here. Thank you, Pietro, for this wonderful introduction. And I, I'm sorry to have to give my talk in English because my Italian is not strong enough uh, to, uh, uh, to allow me to speak in Italian. So Pietro told you about the new title of this talk. I thought that um, a confrontation between the, the two frontiers, like the frontiers between humanities and neuroscience on the one hand and uh, subjective identities on the other. Um, uh, I would like to, to show you that this is one and the same question. So um, I start, you have a handout. I hope it will help you to follow the talk. I put the main quotes on it. Um, okay, so the, the beginning of my reflection uh, pertains to the situation of, uh, let's say, academia in general, and uh, more particularly, uh, the frontiers between what is generally called the humanities and on the other hand, neuroscience. So before I, I start, what do I mean by humanities uh, very generally so that we know what we're talking about? So humanities, as you know, encompass a group of disciplines that studied very gen generally human societies and cultures. So among the humanities, you have anthropology, archeology, span classics, history, linguistics and languages, law and politics, literature, philosophy, at least continental philosophy, religion, arts, and visual arts. So it's a series of disciplines. And we notice today that these disciplines are more and more, um, in a certain sense, recuperated by neuroscience. So I'm sure that you saw the development of these new disciplines like neuroanthropology, neurolinguistics, uh, neuropolitics even, neuroliterature, and neuroaesthetics, and of course, neurophilosophy, uh, the church land in, in the US, I mean, this couple of, of researchers, Paul, and, Paul Churchland and his wife have developed this concept of neurophilosophy. So I would like to share a few reflections with you on, on this topic, because it seems to me that uh, humanities are in a certain sense deprived of their own content today. And they are not, in my opinion, aware of the challenge that is uh, uh, threatening them from the side of the neuroscience. And in my view, there, there does not exist any response 
from any of these disciplines to the challenge that neuro, neuroscience represents for them. So um, most of the time, the only discourse you find in any of the disciplines of the humanities are uh, reactive. Like, we don't want to hear about neuroscience. Our uh, content, our disciplinary content have, has nothing to do with neurology, with the brain, etc. And I think this is a mistake. And that we, on the contrary, have to find a kind of answer to the neuroscientific challenge that will allow for a plasticity precisely of our disciplines and a dialogue that would um, allow uh, for the humanities to be more open to their future and for neurobiology and neuroscience to be also more open to the humanities. Because on, on both sides, we have once again, this reaction, so reactions of the humanities, but also reductionism on the side of uh, neuroscience. So how can we um, imagine, how can we elaborate a new or, well, a dialogue hmm, with neurobiology, a dialogue between our disciplines and neuroscience? How can a genuine, confrontation take place that would both respect the autonomy of each field and redraw their mutual limits and frontiers. How can we think of a neuroplasticity of the humanities that would confer some plasticity to the humanities and some humanity to neurobiology? So I will try to uh, propose today um, an answer from the side of philosophy, because this is my discipline, and give some indications about how philosophy might answer such a challenge. My answer will tend to show, as indicated in my title, that this redefinition of frontiers that we should, um, that we should elaborate, um, in fact, is depending upon other frontiers that are those of the subject, that is uh, subjectivity and more precisely subjective plasticity itself. I think that the, the dialogue revolves around what is a subject, who is the subject and how far can the subject transform itself. Uh, the most recent neurobiological discoveries have worked on the subject, not only on the brain. I think this is an error to think that neuroscience is only working on the brain. Neuroscience is a theory of subjectivity. Even if it is not said like that, it is in reality a reflection on the subject. Who is the subject, the human subject, but also the animal subject? What is a subject? And what, what are the links between the brain and the subject. I say that because, uh, as you know, the, the most recent research in neurology concern um, not only cognition, but also emotions, feelings, social behaviors, uh, the way we act in community, etc., the way we are able to narrate our own histories, to build our own identities. Definitely. Neurology today is about identity and thus about subjectivity. The problem is that most of the time, the neuroscientific definitions of subjectivity, let's call it the subjective brain, are most of the time, as I said a moment ago, very reductive and non-critical. It means that they never integrate uh, the philosophical definitions of subjectivity, and they remain enclosed in themselves. In short, they tend to assert that su subjectivity in reality does not exist. Uh, so this is a very paradoxical position in neuroscience, that neuroscience is a discourse on identity and subjectivity that at the same time affirms that subjectivity does not exist as philosophy has defined it. 
In fact, there's only one reality, which is the empirical reality of the mind, which is the brain. The subject is reduced to the brain. This is an excellent pretext for continental philosophers on their side to entirely reject the neurobiological approach and to go on affirming that subjectivity is irreducible to its biological basis. As Pietro was saying a moment ago, there would be on the one hand a biological subject, which is the brain, and this is how neuroscience is defining subjectivity, like it's, it is something biological. And on the other, we would have a symbolic subjectivity that would have nothing to do uh, with its biological basis. And such uh, a split hmm, is a catastrophe, as I said, to start with, because as long as we are not able to engage this dialogue, I would like to engage myself between the two disciplines, then we have like a war between two camps and clearly the philosophical one is losing. So how can we uh, get out, if such a thing is possible, of this trap? That is on the one hand to affirm there is nothing like a subject and the subject is entirely reducible to their brain. And on the other, there's only a transcendental subject, as Kant would say, only transcendental or symbolic that, and its biological basis has nothing to do with its identity. So in order to, to, um, to start building this dialogue, uh, I will take it literally and imagine a dialogue between two positions, neuroscientific and philosophical. I will start, and this is my, my first quote uh, on the handout. I will start with a very provocative statement by Joseph Ledoux, who's an American neuroscientist in his book called The Synaptic Self. He says, you are your synapses. They are who you are. Hmm? So definition of subjectivity. If there is something like a subject, it is only the synaptic arch architecture. You are your synapses. They are who you are. So um, the brain is who you are. Um, yes, and sorry, the, the, whole, the whole sentence is, the key to humanness is to be found in the microscopic spaces between two nerve cells. So the micro, microscopic spaces between two nerve cells, uh, definition of the synapse, synapses, this, uh, these spaces are precisely the spaces through which neurotransmitters pass. And this is what determines the brain's plasticity. We know that through the synapses, the uh, neural energy is passing, flowing, and depending on the frequency and the volume of this energy, the neural connections through the synapses can change in volume, shape, etc. This is the plasticity of the brain. For example, if you play the piano very often, the synapses implicated, implied in, in the piano playing will uh, allow for the neural connection to grow. If on the contrary, some neural connections are very rarely solicited, the connections will decrease. So the synapses are the doors to the brain, the brain's plasticity. So you see that Ledoux is very radical. This is only, I mean, we are only our, our brain's plasticity. The synapses are who you are. Okay, so from there, uh, let's imagine a dialogue between a cognitivist philosopher uh, who, is, uh, uh, who agrees with Ledoux. This philosopher is Thomas Metzinger. He's German. He has a very uh, important book that is Being No One. 
that was published by MIT Press, a big book in which uh, Metzinger demonstrates that subjectivity does not exist outside the brain, that we can be totally reduced to our brain. And on the other, French philosopher Michel Foucault, uh, that, who, as you know, has produced an enormous work on the concept of subjectivity. So I will take this sentence, you are your synapses, just this one, and I will follow it word after word by engaging the dialogue between the two philosophers on each word. So let's start with the you. You are your synapses. You, how is it to be understood? Metzinger draws from Ledoux's statement that the subject, you, me, I, the self, does not exist per se. This is what he demonstrates in his book uh, that I just mentioned, Being No One, that came out in 2003. He affirms, this is the second quote, nobody ever was or had a self. The self is not a thing, but a process. And this process is brain plasticity. Something like subjectivity cannot exist outside the constant uh, formation of the neural connections. Uh, so the subject is entirely identical with the life of the brain. Foucault would answer, well, you are not saying anything new because Kant before you had already brought to light the non-substantial character of the subject. Um, I will refer here to uh, Foucault's text called What is Enlightenment from 1984. Uh, that insists on the fact that um, the self in Kant is, is just consciousness. That consciousness also is not a substance, but at the same time, it is a subject. He would answer Metzinger that uh, subjectivity can exist without being necessarily an essence, but without being uh, a, a biological basis either. He says, consciousness stems, I quote from uh, what is enlightenment, consciousness stems from three broad ideas, relations of, of control over things, relation of action upon others, relations with oneself. It is well known that control over things is medi med mediated sorry, by relations with others and relations with others in turn always entail relations with oneself. So you see what Foucault says here is that if we, if we read the sentence very closely, what we find is that subjectivity is a network, a series of relations over things, upon others, and with oneself. So Foucault answers Metzinger, I know that subjectivity is only a network, a network of relations, but nevertheless, it cannot be confused with something biological. Hmm? So in fact, we agree on the definition of subjectivity as something that perhaps does not exist as a substance, that perhaps is entirely reducible to a network, but this is not biological. This is political, this is social. Metzinger uh, would answer precisely that these relations, these networks that Foucault calls consciousness are delusionary because the idea of a relation with oneself 
as Foucault says, relations with oneself. For Metzinger, the very idea of a relation with oneself is an illusion. This illusion that uh, makes me say, I, I, Catherine, is created by specific neural processes Neural processes that Metzinger called, well, gathers under the term neural transparency, so that the I of the subject is a transparent self model. I quote, this is the, the fourth quote the self is its own appearance, since it is a model which cannot which cannot perceive itself as a model and thus exists only in so far as it does not perceive itself as a model. What in philosophy of mind is called the phenomenal self and what in scientific or folk psychological context frequently is simply referred to as the self is the content of a phenomenally transparent self model. The subjective experience of being someone emerges if a conscious information processing system operates under a transparent self model. It is transparent. You look right through it, but you don't see it. You see with it. You constantly confuse yourself with the content of the self model currently activated by your brain. So I'm sorry, it's a long quote, complicated, but what does that say? It says that consciousness, the fact of saying I, I, Catherine, is a result of a series of long neural processes that erase themselves instantaneously by creating an illusion of transparency so that I immediately see myself as an I. But in fact, my eye is just a window through which I see, but it is impossible for me to see the window itself. I see through the window, but I don't see the window itself because the window is made of these all long neural processes that allow for the subject, for, for the eye to exist, but disappear in this instantaneous transparency. So in fact, the I is just the result of a long series of processes that are entirely neural. And it is just a window, just like I open my eyes. I open my eyes and I say I, but in reality, it's never originary. It's the result of long processes. So the first person perspective, the I, I am, is not at all an origin, like the philosophers think, like Descartes or Foucault. It's a series of many progressive biological processes that disappear instantaneously from the realm of consciousness. The first person perspective is, I quote, activated in such a fast and reliable way as to make any earlier processing stages inaccessible to introspection. The experience of the immediacy of consciousness thus emerges as a temporal fiction that proceeds from the impossibility of consciousness turning back upon itself and having access to its own biological past. So this is, I think, very important. What we call introspection, when I reflect upon myself, is never originary. Because in fact, the true introspection would mean for me the possibility of looking in my brain in order to see all the loops that made my subjectivity possible. And this is impossible. So in fact, introspection is just an illusion, a, second, a secondary process. You know, it looks like these uh, drawings by Escher, you know, these loops that Escher is drawing, like these... Uh, scales or stairs that never lead anywhere, uh, these loops, these mazes. I mean, if we try to look in our brain, we wouldn't see anything, but a series of, of uh, 
processes and anyway, it is impossible. So for Medica, we are not able to turn back on ourselves. We are not able to access the neural stages of our consciousness's formation. So that's why the brain has to find an efficient way to break the loop, to make information available without engaging the system in endless internal loops. And this, this uh, efficient way to break the uh, labyrinth is the I. When I say I, Catherine, all the processes are erased and I have the illusion that everything starts with me. Let's now go back to Foucault. So once again, Metzinger wouldn't, wouldn't believe at all in Foucault's definition of the subject as a series of networks uh, uh, laying foundation on the relation to ourselves. It might be true, Foucault would say, but it doesn't mean that the subject cannot construct itself precisely out of this absence of origin. It may be true that we cannot turn back on ourselves. And there are beautiful uh, pages by Foucault reading Blanchot. Uh, I don't know if you know these pages by Maurice Blanchot where he talks about Orpheus and Eurydice. And Blanchot thematizes the fact that we, we, we never, we are not allowed to look back, to turn back on ourselves because something like the past of subjectivity is always erased. And Foucault says, it is perhaps true that we cannot access something like the past of the subject or the, uh, the essential nature of the subject, but it doesn't mean that precisely we can't construct our identity out of this absence of origin. After all, being a subject can also mean being a subject without an origin, which is not contradictory for Foucault. And he says in the, in the Kantian sense, the subject is the constitution of the self as an autonomous subject. And it's true that, and Pietro, perhaps we, we can discuss that afterward. I mean, afterwards, um, when Kant says we're autonomous, it can also mean we, we have no origin. Mm -hmm. And that autonomy is perhaps also a window through which we see without being able to see the window itself. Um, so let, let's now move to the second uh, uh, term, R, U, R, which is um, ontological. Mm? It, it, it pertains, of course, to the category of being. Precisely, Foucault says, uh, being subjects without origin uh, lead us to produce what he calls in the texts of 1984, a historical ontology of ourselves says the fact that we have no origin, that we are subjects without origin has an ontological value. And we have to produce a historical ontology of ourselves. What does it consist in? It's the following quotes. It is about how are we constituted as subjects of our own knowledge? How are we constituted as subjects who exercise and submit to power relations? How are we constituted as moral subjects uh, of our own actions? So it means that, you see, it pertains to autonomy to the extent that we, we have no origin. We don't know where we come from. We cannot turn back on ourselves because subjectivity is, non, is not essential. We have to plastically construct ourselves. Precisely, I mean, the answer to Metzinger is that, okay, we have no origin. So that's why we have to construct ourselves as subject. And this is the meaning of plasticity. And the meaning of plasticity, as you see, is about knowledge, subjects of our own knowledge, um, subjects, subject of our power relations. How, how do we are engage in power relations with others? And uh, what kind of moral subject we are. But it, it, every time, each time, it's about our task to construct ourselves as such. Um, the critical ontology of ourselves, he goes on, is not a theory, it's not a doctrine, 
it's not a permanent body of knowledge that is accumulating, but a practical and political re-elaboration of the concept of freedom. Ontology, Foucault says, this is the following quote, has to be conceived as an attitude, an ethos, a philosophical life in which the critique of what we are is that one and the same as a work carried out by ourselves upon ourselves as free being. So you see the subject, in fact, what we are is the result of a work carried out by ourselves, which is once again, a plastic work on ourselves. Metzinger would answer, you're too confident in autonomy because biological determinism that determines the subject, I mean, all the loops and processes I was talking about a moment ago that are at the origin of consciousness are biologically hardwired. And so uh, Metzinger answers Foucault, um, you're too confident in autonomy. There can't be no autonomy to the extent that um, all the processes that are included in, our, in the fashioning of our consciousness are motor processes. They are just like mechanical. Uh, our brain is like a machine constructed by a series of, uh, uh, yes, of uh, uh, functioning uh, uh, apparatus hmm, that, I mean, to, to call that, to, to imagine that we can have any autonomy out of that is a pure illusion. And he says, perhaps I can admit the word ontology, but then we would have to say the only possible ontology is what he calls a functional ontology, which is the ontology of a functioning, not of something autonomous. So therefore, for Metzinger, there can't exist any ontological dimension of something like subjectivity. And he says, this is the following quote, there is no way the subject from the inside can become aware of his own neurons from the inside. They can be known only objectively from the outside. There is no inner eye watching the brain itself, perceiving neurons and glia. The brain is transparent from the standpoint of the subject. So the only way for Metzinger in which we could uh, approach something like the subject or subjective plasticity would be from outside, but from the inside, it is impossible. Says, in fact, we would need for that a method to explore once again the uh, interiority of our brain, but, but it is impossible. He says the only the only way we have to explore the inside of the brain is through technical imagery, and we use it to explore brain pathologies. But the functioning of the normal brain cannot can never be um, it, well. It is forever impossible, at least from the inside. If I can say, I can grasp this object with my hands, I can see with my eyes, I cannot really say, I think with my brain, because this expression, my brain, is not associated with any experience. Because nobody can feel his or her brain the brain, in a certain sense, does not belong to the body proper. It is never here, always there. It is nowhere. The brain has no subjective sight. So in that sense, once again, there can't be any ontology of the brain, any ontology or any uh, autonomy. Um, 
So just a few words uh, again on a um, few more words about ontology. Um, Foucault would say, yes, but when I talk about the ontology of ourselves, um, I mean that ontology is about being, but if we think of a plastic ontology, it means that fashioning is always prior to being. What I call the fashioning of subjectivity means in fact that, I, well, Foucault would almost agree with the functional um, ontology because he says, uh, what is the ontology of ourselves? It is the creation of a um, lifestyle. You know how technologies of the self are important for Foucault. He says, uh, when I speak about autonomy, once again, I'm not talking about something substantial. I'm talking about a series of techniques through which we form ourselves, through which we become who we are. Lifestyle techniques, uh, moral techniques, asceticism, everything that he develops in the last, in his last uh, seminars. Um, Yes, I also uh, put on my hands out a quote by Judith Butler, who has a, a very uh, interesting text in which she um, uh, interprets Foucault's uh, What is Enlightenment? Uh, and this text is called What is Critique? An Essay on Foucault's Virtue. And she says, Foucault will be particularly interested in the problem of how that delimited field forms the subject and how in turn, the subject comes to form and reform those reasons. The capacity to form reasons will be importantly linked to the self-transformative relation. To be critical of an authority requires a critical practice that has self-transformation at its core. So in that, in that sentence, in that passage, what Butler insists upon is once again, the fact that for Foucault, Subjectivity is nothing outside its own transformation and that this transformation is in its respect technological. It is also functional and yet it is not biological. So you see, uh, in fact, the, the two authors seem to agree and at the same time fundamentally disagree because what they understand under the term functional or technological or form or plastic or formative, transformative is at the same time inassimilable, uh, fundamentally different. So I will now approach my last term before I conclude, which is synapse. You are your synapses. So a few, um, a few words about uh, a synapse, what is it? It is a term that was fashioned in, 19, in 1897 by an English um, physiologist called Sherrington, Charles Sherrington. And it comes from the Greek word, and that's interesting because um, the Greek word is synaptain, which means, it's a verb, mean, meaning to fasten together. It's very close to Kant's synthesis. It's almost a synthesis. Synapse is what brings together, grasps together. Um, so synapses, as I said a moment ago, are the spaces between the brain cells. And um, it is once again through these spaces that neural energy can circulate and modify the form of the neural connections. So is it possible to think of a synaptic connection between philosophy and neuroscience? A connection that would both maintain the separation between them while making communication between them possible. So this is a, a difficult problem because I think that both Medzinger and Foucault would admit that we are our synapses. Foucault would understand it as we are our syntheses, 
in the Kantian sense. But once again, we would find the, the gap or the abyss between a biological synapse and a transcendental synapse. That is between a synapse and a synthesis. And at the same time, as you can see, there's something common. So if we enlarge the discussion and now go back to humanities and neuroscience, what do we, what do, we do with this question of the synapse? the synapse and the synthesis? And can we imagine the kind of neurotransmitter that will allow for humanities and neuroscience to bring together, to, 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 to dialogue or to, uh, to get into dialogue and to, uh, oh, to plastically transform uh, themselves? So now I will take... Um, speak a little bit about some university academy, academy uh, by mentioning a text by Jacques Derrida called uh, University Without Condition. And he agrees uh, that the future of the humanities depends on how we determine the very border between their inside and their outside. So in fact, today we all have this synaptic question. If we think of uh, all our disciplines of the humanities, uh, be it art, philosophy, anthropology, etc., etc., we, we necessar necessarily have today to inquire about what is the inside and what is the outside of this discipline. And Derrida says, on this border, between, on, on this border within a discipline, um, university must negotiate and organize its resistance. It means that if we want to protect our disciplines, we have to determine the inside and the outside in order to be able to resist politically. Resist what? Resist the tendency of power to destroy the humanities. We know today that the humanities are in danger that they disappear every, everywhere in the world. And so Derrida says, in order to resist, we really have to uh, engage a reflection on what is the boundaries, what are the boundaries of our disciplines. And this is how, and this is at this moment that Derrida announces a new concept of the humanities. He says the new concept of the humanities should include law, legal studies, as well as what is called in this country, uh, the US, where this formation originated, theory, an original articulation of literary theory, translation theory, philosophy, linguistics, anthropology, etc. Cetera, et cetera. But as you can see, he doesn't mention neuroscience. And this is something that is typical of continental philosophy. There have been a lot of reflections on uh, borders, on discipline, disciplinary borders, uh, on the necessity to uh, redraw these borders, but a genuine dialogue with science and in particular neuroscience is not even evoked. He just says at some point uh, in the book, he says natural science and medicine, but it's very general and we don't know exactly what he wants to do with that. And yet, as I, I was saying in, in the beginning, we know today that a lot of um, our disciplines are retranslated and reappropriated by neuroscience. And that in certain departments in the US, for example, if I think of a, a university like Duke University, you have a big cluster of disciplines gathered behind the title neurohumanities. So we see that more and more our disciplines are being, yes, appropriated by neuroscience and that from 
the point of view of our disciplines, the point of view of humanities, it seems that no one is really taking this challenge seriously. And so even, as I said, in texts that, are, that want to redraw university, recreate new borders, etc., this precise challenge is never taken into account. Um, and neurohumanities, generally speaking, the way in which they are most of the time, I say most of the time, taught, uh, developed, etc., is a catastrophe. It's a catastrophe. For example, if you think of neuroaesthetics, it is just the study of how our brain reacts when it sees the red color of the green color. It, it is entirely reductive. It has no interest. It's a catastrophe. So in order to give you an example, uh, I have a long quote that, that will be uh, practically the last one, a long quote from um, an article Uh, a very interesting article um, called Literary Brains, Neuroscience, Criticism and Theory it was published. It's a bit old already. It's published in 2014. Uh, but I think it's very, uh, still very accurate in which he says, he takes the example of neural literature and he says, as long as we want to renew this discipline, it will kill literature. So I quote, the neurohumanities are largely traditional fields of humanistic study, prominently including literature and related arts, such as film, that have taken up findings or methods of neuroscience to advance their research. It is probably too early to undertake a survey of research in neuroscientific literary criticism and theory. However, there is considerable interest among literary scholars in the possibilities for such criticism and theory. And there are many areas of neuroscientific research that have begun to be incorporated into literary study or are likely to do so in the near future. This said, the author notices that the body of work in neurohumanities is limited because much of the work that has been done falls into the broad category of what we might call correlational criticism, which is often the initial phase of a new theoretical approach to literary analysis. So what is it, correlational criticism? It, it consists when a critic takes some neuroscientific concept and finds parallels for its elements and principles in literature. For example, Proust's treatment of memory might, seen, might be seen as anticipating that of some neuroscience scientists, as in Lehrer's widely read book, Proust was a neuroscientist. And this is certainly not interesting and not productive because the text then becomes a pure pretext. We can also mention here the attempt at applying synesthesia to literary criticism. What colors do you see when you read? or at explaining a work of art according to, a bra to brain processing of visual information. Most of the time, such attempts are gestures of normalization of the humanities and not a genuinely critical gesture or, or inquiry. So sorry for, for this long quote, but you see what the problem is. It says, of course, this is interesting and a lot of uh, scholars are getting more and more interested in the new method of neural literature, but most of the time, uh, neural criticism or neural literature consists in taking one concept and applying it systematically to the text without ever questioning the accuracy of, of that concept. Or um, yes, what colors do you see when you read? Like a, a, a kind of a basic reductive uh, correlation between the brain and what you understand or see. And it produces nothing. And it is absolutely uh, non-critical. So once again, 
it seems that we are um, we are witnessing a, a gap, um, as I said a moment ago, an abyss between the two uh, disciplines like humanities and neuroscience, and that humanities are not yet able to develop a real resistance to neuroscience that would at the same time open, be an opening to neuroscience and develop interesting ways of integrating neuroscience within their uh, realm. So um, in, all, in conclusion, I will conclude on that. This is something I would like to propose to you for our discussion, as you know, more and more um, in, in the humanities precisely, there's, an, there's uh, another body of knowledge that is uh, devel developing and uh, getting more and more importance that are post-colonial uh, and decolonial and studies, black studies that are also revolving around subjectivity. And these disciplines have also uh, produced a profound shift within the disciplines of the humanity, the humanities. And the other day I was rereading the very famous Franz Fanon, a black skin, white masks. And I don't know if you remember this passage. It says, um, we have to elaborate a new discipline, which is sociogeny. And this is a discipline that includes both, both sociology and phylogeny, that is something biological. So in order to study the black problem, we would have to bring together a sociological approach to slavery, to black identity, etc., but also to study how biologically the trauma of slave, slavery has been integrated within the biological bodies of black people. That's why he says psychoanalysis alone cannot be the answer to black subjectivity, to the problem of black subjectivity, black trauma. We need a new science that would, a new discipline that would cross the biological and the cultural. And I also found in uh, Sylvia Winter's uh, uh, writings, she's a, a wonderful Jamaican writer, and a very, a very uh, interesting interpret of Fanon. And um, she has this um, article towards the sociogenic principle, Fanon, the puzzle of conscious experience of identity and what it's like to be black. And she, she writes, and this is my last quote, Fanon's sociogenic conception of the human, one generated from the ground of his own, as well as that, it, that of his fellow French Caribbean subjects live experience of being black, of what it is like to be black, also opens a frontier. So it's interesting, the notion of frontier, also opens a frontier onto the solution to the problem defined by David Chalmers as that of the puzzle of conscious experience. And David Chalmers is a neuroscientist. The puzzle, both as to how a subjective experience could possibly arise from the neural processes in the brain, as well as to why all this processing has to be accompanied by an experienced inner life. Against the reductionism of the physicalistic thesis, which proposes that mind or consciousness is simply what the brain does, Chalmers puts forward the hypothesis of the existence of as yet uncovered fundamental laws that are specific to the phenomenon of conscious experience. So, you know, I think this is fascinating fascinating because she says in order to explain what sociogeny is that um, that's neural processes in the brain 
have to be taken into account to explain how the trauma of black subjectivity, etc., cetera, um, has fashioned the subjectivity itself, but that these neural processes at the same time have engendered, have created an experience, a subjective experience. And that's so, it is impossible to really separate. Uh, the biological inscription of the trauma and uh, something like the creation of, of subjectivity out of it, experience. And I like what she says because she says, uh, consciousness is a hybrid biological form that is bios logos form. Hmm? So that, that brings uh, biology and rationality together. So um, with Fanon, I would say that humans are always already both skin, bios, and mask, logos. And I think that instead of uh, rejecting neuroscience, instead, conversely, of devaluating critique and subjectivity, instead of teaching unhelpful neurohumanities or unhelpful self-centered humanities, one might hope for a political awareness of the necessity to consider the brain as the locus of both the biological experience and of the subjective experience that uh, plasticity allows us to define as the key to every kind of identity. So thank you very much for, for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we open now the debate. Please write in the chat when you want to take the floor. Uh, thank you, Vittorio, for David Chalmers. No, he's not a neuroscientist, he's a philosopher of, of the mind. Sorry, yes, I, I know that it was an, a mistake when I wrote uh, the talk. I was in a hurry, so thank you. So first, uh, is there someone here in the room who wants to make a question? Please, come, you should come here. Well, first of all, thank you very much for your lecture. Um, I have a very trivial question um, regarding the political implications of this neuro, sorry, of this neuroscientific approach. Um, do you think this, that this neuroscientific attitude in humanities implies or produces a transformation within social science? I am focusing here my attention, especially on social sciences and not on humanities in general. And so, the, the, yeah, sorry. Yes, yes, yeah, no, go on, go on. Okay, thank you, thank you. And um, so, I mean, if a subject is only a sum of neurochemical processes, what is left of the political agency of free political agency and autonomy? And can this reductionist approach give an explanation of social and political change? How would um, a neuro, a philosopher who uh, thinks in terms of um, the materiality of the brain conceive social change, for example? And how does this reductionist neuroscientific approach explain complex social processes? Thank you. Olympia Maladesta. Okay, thank you very much for, for your question. Of course, this is a, a very important uh, question. I will just um, take an example uh, about, um, and, and Vittorio, if he listens to us, um, can intervene in the discussion about neural neurons uh, that are so important for in, in Vittorio's work. There was um, an article published in the French newspaper Le Monde from a sociologist, French sociologist, who said, this is uh, scandalous 
to develop the thesis of mirror neurons, because it, you know uh, what mirror neurons are, uh, these neurons that allow us to mirror without having to do it, uh, some actions of others. For example, if I see you uh, playing piano, uh, these, my mirror neurons will um, mirror precisely these activities so that I can uh, access mm, by imagination, so to speak, or empathy, depending on the circumstances, what you're actually doing. So this sociologies said in Le Monde, so this is the end of structuralism, uh, according to which if we, uh, and, and even earlier than structuralism, if we uh, refer to Durkheim, for example, we know that uh, uh, a community, a social community, never relies on biological processes. It's not, if, if we are together, it's not because we mirror each other. Hmm? It's not because we reflect the other's actions. We are here together structurally. It's, and, and, and this is where he uh, refers to Levi Strauss by saying that what, what keeps us together, and Pietro was talking about that a moment ago, is the symbolic. So we, we are like different fragments of a broken piece. And we are together because of that. We are together because precisely we don't mirror each other. We are together without being really together. And structuralism explain this with and without, that is the origin of uh, the social. And the article says, if we follow the theory of mirror neurons, then community becomes uh, a transparency. We're all together. We can uh, uh, perfectly understand each other. And it's, so I totally agree with you that such uh, a, a possibility would be a catastrophe and that it is a serious threat to sociology because it would uh, once again uh, imply that um, in fact, nothing is symbolic, but things are immediate, immediately transparent, et cetera, biologically from, from uh, uh, and this would be allowed for, by bio, biology. Now, I think at the same time, the sociologist were, was wrong to interpret uh, the theory of mirror neurons like he did, because I don't think, I mean, um, in fact, and but we would have to discuss a lot about that. I, I don't think that um, uh, the, the fact of taking the brain into account is necessarily a threat to uh, the political understanding of the community, uh, but and this was the meaning of my talk, we would need to seriously elaborate a political approach to neuroscience. So I'm sorry, I, I, I didn't answer. I just gave you some uh, elements. Um, if there are no, uh, please, there's another question. Hi, um, I'm Chiara Cagliazzo. <laughs> First of all, thanks a lot for your lecture. It was really interesting. And actually, I have a question about, I mean, more of kind of a curiosity, because um, your approach really reminded me a lot of Rosi Braidotti's approach. So I'm thinking especially about the book Posthuman Knowledge. I think it was from 2018 or 2017. By the way, it's pretty recent. And the thing is that I was wondering what you thought about that, because actually I think there are a lot of connections and similarities, like for example, the idea also of transdisciplinarity or nomadic subjects maybe. So what if we kind of adopt also a more rhizomatic approach to knowledge and to the way humanities are constructed and in general also like, because I think she, from what I remember, she also talks about the way universities are structured, not just the humanities. And she kind of advocates for a, broadening of all the fields um, in order to kind of establish a more horizontal and collaboration oriented approach in all subjects. So I was wondering what, what do you think about this kind of approach and whether it kind of resonates with you? Thanks. Yes, thank you very much, Chiara. It totally resonates with, uh, with my talk and, and with what I'm thinking. And I think that today there's a kind of, uh, well, it's not today, it has, it's 
started a few years ago already, uh, and even many years ago, a kind of feminist front uh, between thinkers like Braidotti, but also Haraway, uh, who clearly have associated the problem of uh, feminism, uh, uh, relying on the idea that um, the feminine, let's call it that way uh, for the moment, that the feminine has never been really represented uh, in any kind of disciplines, be they um, literary or scientific. So linking the problem of the representation of the feminine with the uh, problem of this horizontal enlargement of uh, um, academic networks, academic disciplinary networks. Um, and I was, um, I totally agree with you that uh, uh, Braidotti's approach is very interesting in that respect. And I was also thinking that uh, recently, as you know, Haraway has also included animals, uh, particularly dogs in her ref reflection on uh, this kind of um, plastification of boundaries between, uh, between, between subjects. Um, and this also resonates with what I was uh, talking about at the end of my talk, which is the black problem, which is that we, we cannot, I think, develop these reflections on uh, disciplines and borders between disciplines without also uh, reflecting on excluded subjects. Uh, what subjects have been um, excluded from um, academic fields? Uh, so thank you very much for your questions, because I think that Braidotti, Haraway, and perhaps myself, are, we are very concerned with uh, that kind of question. <clears throat> Hello, and uh, uh, I'm uh, Benedetta Piazzesi. Thank you very much uh, for your lecture. Just linking to uh, the last thing uh, you, were, you were saying uh, um, about objects that are excluded from disciplines, uh, I think that uh, on the same frontier between uh, a biological subject and the symbolic uh, subject about uh, which you have uh, talked, uh, um, other approaches uh, um, uh, now from uh, humanities like history and especially uh, ethnography tries, uh, try to uh, include animals and so biological subjectivity, for example, with uh, uh, the, the concept of animal cultures. And so I was wondering what uh, you talk about, uh, what uh, you think about uh, this uh, expansive uh, approach uh, from uh, inside humanities uh, to new objects that uh, may come from uh, uh, natural sciences. Thank you. Excuse me, my, my, my microphone was off. Um, precisely, I, I mean, I'm, I'm very much in favor of this enlargement of objects and, and new questions, etc. So I'm sorry, I have nothing else to say that, than uh, that totally um, defend that kind of approach. I think that Vittorio on the chat has something to say, am I right? We just, yeah, let, let's give room to the students. Uh, if there uh, okay, are more okay. questions, All right, I'm, I'm happy to wait. Okay. Let's just ask if there is some other question here in the room or otherwise would give, yeah, please, please. Uh, hi, my name is Simone Gandhi, and uh, thanks so much for your talk, uh, which I found very interesting. And uh, my question is going to be very um, short, and is somehow related to the other question you already received. Um, my question is, uh, why for philosophy, uh, reductionism or determinism, should be a problem. And my question is why reductionism is wrong? Uh, why reductionism is uh, limiting? And why talking about a free agency is necessary? So um, my question in the end is, um, don't you think that if philosophy needs to find a way to challenge uh, neuroscience and 
um, is to face determinism, is to face reductionism as a possibility. And so maybe the premises that reductionism or determinism is something wrong, is wrong, or maybe is outdated nowadays. So this is my question. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. This is a, a fundamental question. And you're right, after all, uh, why would uh, determinism be considered so bad, determinism or reductionism? And why in continental philosophy do we have such a resistance to it? Um, so I agree this is a true question. At the same time, I agree also with Winter that I quoted in the end that there can't be any uh, reductionist or any deterministic approach without subjective consequences of it. That is uh, that, um, for example, let's describe um, autonomy as just a series of uh, uh, functional processes, like I'm pushing button, et cetera, et cetera, you know, uh, uh, these uh, experiences on, on free will that have been conducted by neuroscientists, etc. Okay, all right, Let, let's admit they are um, teaching us something about free will, etc. My question is, yes, but immediately these, re these kinds of results create a subjective reaction because you cannot help thinking, okay, if will is this, what does that mean for me? What does that mean for us? What kind of subjective experience, what kind of experience by experience, I mean, what are the, the biographical effects of these discoveries? What does this mean for me? Right? Uh, how does this research, how do, sorry, this research affect me? So in my view, reductionism is perhaps not bad per se, but it is half the problem. You know? uh, wh what it doesn't take into account is the reflective aspect of, of its reflective aspect, which is like, how do we understand that? What do we do with that? Uh, what, is the, what are the consequences for us? You see what I mean? And this is where critique starts. Huh? How do we critically receive the results or uh, discoveries of, um, yes, of neuroscientists? Well, we met, might, I there's another one. Yeah. So I'm Julia Bernard, and um, thank you very much for your Hello. talk. Um, I just a very naive question. Um, as far as I've understood your point, uh, you are, are concerned with the, um, so to say, the inner border of discipline and humanities. And um, you seem to sketch a appropriation gesture from the side of neurosciences. And um, you, you are saying we have as humanities, uh, we have to face these challenges and integrate um, objects from uh, neurosciences. And my question regards uh, the, not the inner border, but the outer border. And I was wondering, uh, and I repeat, it's just very naive question. Um, what image do we have um, of um, the neurosciences as such as disciplines? And in other words, are we, um, uh, which kind of plasticity as disciplines uh, neurosciences have? Um, is there a reason for neurosciences to uh, take on, on this debate with uh, uh, humanities? Uh, is there a value in this dialogue? Or in other words, is um, this critical uh, preoccupation just a preoccupation for a philosophy or could it be um, a value also for neurosciences as such hmm, to reflect on their disciplinarities and on their plasticity as such. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. This is a very important question. This is not naive at all. Um, neuroscience, anyway, is a, is a series of disciplines, as you know. It is a unique name for a series of disciplines. 
so of course, because of that, um, neuroscience is, is a constant, well, is constantly trying to redefine itself and think of its own borders. And um, so what is the value of that? And, and what is, the, as you said, the image, um, the image, I think the value of that is that is linked with the scientific revolution that was um, brought about by the discovery precisely of brain plasticity. Uh, I mean, until, well, until very late in the 20th century, the brain was seen as just, a, you know, um, a machine and Pavlov was the model, you press a button and that, you know, there's a reflex, et cetera, et cetera. And with the discovery of neural plasticity, I mean, the whole field of, of, neuro, of neurology changed, but not only the field of neurology, but also uh, the, as I said in the beginning, the reflection of, the reflection on what is a subject, because if the brain is plastic, it means that all our experiences, all our uh, life encounters, everything that we live through, traumas, et cetera, et cetera, is imprinting itself on the brain. So that instead of having a brain like just determined by a series of cords and buttons, et cetera, uh, our brain is just a kind of reflection, an archive, it is an archive of our identity. So in that sense, we are witnessing uh, a total revolution of uh, not only the how subjectivity is approached, but also of pathologies, of uh, the, the relationships between the brain and the psyche, uh, the relationship between uh, neurology and psychoanalysis. So if you want, the value is enormous because it is uh, linked with all the consequences of this revolution. It is um, an epistemological transformation of, of, the, of knowledge that, that is uh, enormous. And so the question that we have to, to ask is what about our disciplines? By our disciplines, once again, I mean, I mean the humanities. How do we react to that? Uh, necessarily, we have, we have to because if it is true that the brain is plastic, it also concerns philosophy, art, uh, anthropology, politics, etc. But how do we react? And the value is enormous. I mean, this is an enormous challenge. I think there's a Pasquale who wants to ask something. I see on this. Yes. Please, Pasquale Fruscello. Here I am. Yes, Pasquale. Thank you for inviting everybody. And I am a surgeon, and it's a very pleasure to be here and listening to you, Catherine. <laughs> and I want, I want to ask this question. Uh, I've been speaking, we have been speaking about plasticity for about 30 years as a surgeon. Okay, so I look at plasticity in a physical mm -hmm. way. Okay, it's not a philosophical way. Yes. I have touched plasticity as a body. Okay, but um, and I wrote a book uh, whose title is "Mold Your Yourself is Plasm uh, Plasma Te Stesso Mold Yourself." Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah, and now I am I am transforming this point of view. Uh, um, a surgical, medical point of view in a philosophical, sociological point of view. That's why I'm here listening to you. And uh, I am writing another thing, but I don't know if this idea, idea is crazy. And I want to show you this work is this about ontology. This is in Italian. La carne ontologia possibile in, in English is the flesh. Uh, the flesh is, for me, is ontological. Why? Because the flesh, our flesh, um, include everything. Everything is in the flesh. I, <laughs> I think so. 
this is a page of my book. And when I speak about beautiness, about ego, about plasticity, and about the body mind and uh, chronotope uh, relationship, then this is the philosophical dictionary uh, by Voltaire. And everything is in the flesh. Everything is flesh. Also, Abbe, Abramo, Adam, Anima. Also, Anima, M in French is M, Anima. Um, uh, everything are synonym, synonym of flesh. Um, and also information and also space time is in the flesh. And, uh, but it's very strange that in the philosophical dictionary, the, the word fresh does not exist. This is an Italian um, dictionary. We can read caratterologia, we can read caso, we can read castigo, but there is no carne. Carne, there is no mention of flesh in dictionary. And very strange, also in Voltaire dictionary, there is no flesh and there is no liberté. We can, uh, between legge and lusso, Lux and uh, la, la, la le non, we don't we don't read liberty. It's very very strange. For me, liberty is flesh also. Um, but let me. Could you put your question? Yes, the question is this: this idea of flesh as ontology is totally crazy, or not? <laughs> well, well, thank you very much. Um... So I would say that, first of all, it's not entirely true. You have concepts of flesh in philosophy, but, but the problem is that I would, I would answer to you that as soon as you uh, think together flesh and ontology, it dematerializes the flesh. That's the problem, sure. for example, in phenomenology. Hmm? You have important concepts of flesh, like in Husserl, the difference between a body as körper in German and body as flesh. And for Husserl, flesh is the spiritualized form of meat. Yes. Says the flesh is not the meat. That's, okay. As soon as you say sure. that, it's yes. not, it includes a, a dimension of uh, immateriality. Yes. You know I mean? yes. So sure. How do you deal with that? How do you deal with that? I mean, um, when you say freedom is flesh, uh, I don't know, everything is flesh. How, if you accept to separate flesh and meat, then it means that you include in the flesh something that is more than just a piece of matter. Sure. So, yes. And that's a this problem. Is, this, is, this is the hypothesis. That's why I, I, I asked to you. There is a practical idea because I think that if we consider our flesh as an ontology, we can live happier, we can live richer, we can live um, very better. It's a, a way of living that ameliorate if we consider us as an ontology, if, if, if we consider our flesh uh, as an ontology. It's a, it's a, a new um, perspective that I'm, I'm considering. I was reading just for synchronicity, two minutes uh, ago, um, a passage from D'Annunzio, Il Piacere. Adesso questo è in inglese. E qui lui guarisce, il protagonista guarisce da una malattia. E, e lo dico questo agli, agli amici filosofi. E lui dice questo. Qualche cosa è in lui più vigile del pensiero, più continua del desiderio, più potente della volontà, più profonda anche della coscienza ed è la sostanza, la natura dell'essere suo. E io dico questo è la carne. Everything is in the flesh. Okay, okay. I, <laughs> no, will, I will have to press, see. Press, I am a surgeon. It's a deformity. <laughs> it's, a, it's a, a mental okay. deformity. Uh, but everywhere I, I see, I read, there is the, the, the ontology of the flesh for me. And I'm working on this crazy idea. But I, I, insist, I, I insist on this. And I want to, to, 
to submit this, this idea to you, a philosopher and a very, very great Thank man. You. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you. So Professor, Mon Morio? Sì, Professor Montan. Ah. Okay. I, I think that Victorio uh, posed before me the, yeah. the, the question. Mm -hmm. Victorio, would you, would you speak? Yeah, yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, more than a question, uh, uh, a short comment. Um, I think that the picture of neuroscience, uh, first of all, thank you for your talk. Uh, very interesting, very stimulating. But I have some, some comment. Uh, I can't but make some comments on the way you portrayed neuroscience. <laughs> no, uh, I, I know. <laughs> uh, I mean, uh, first of all, it, there's no such a thing as neuroscience as a monolithic. I think you, you said that uh, a few minutes ago. So we should speak uh, about the neurosciences because uh, the people uh, that uh, deal with the brain uh, do so from a variety of uh, vantage point and levels of description that goes all the way from molecules, neurotransmitters, to uh, a more integrated view, uh, like in the case of uh, cognitive neuroscience, um, as in my uh, personal case. Second, I don't think that we need to challenge neuroscience. I don't see neuroscience uh, as a challenge or a, even worse, as a menace. Uh, at the very least in my <laughs> very personal list of uh, menacing and, and very dangerous things that need to be challenged, there are other items. Uh, there is uh, the condensation of power in very few uh, big firm that uh, already as we speak at the uh, uh, are monopolistic uh, in a series of technology that dictate uh, our lifestyle, uh, our education, our access to the news, to politics and the like. And in turn, uh, this big firm, uh, um, just because of their enormous budget that largely exceed the, the, the uh, gross internal product of many nations, are able to offer uh, very advantageous conditions to a lot of scientists, engineers, uh, physicists, uh, informatics, uh, uh, neuroscientists, uh, um, contending them to even the richest uh, university of the Ivy League of the United States. So in the long run, I see uh, more and more difficult for public institution uh, to fund uh, um, uh, crucial forms of research uh, that will become more and more the monopoly of these big companies with all the consequences for freedom, democracy, and the like. That said, uh, I don't like uh, neuroesthetics, although I do experimental aesthetics. Uh, uh, more broadly, I don't like any uh, uh, supposedly new discipline uh, which uh, uh, uses the prefix uh, neuron, neuro uh, to be followed by aesthetics, politics, ethics, sociology, etc., etc., etc. I have uh, a, a sort of allergy uh, mm -hmm. for uh, the boundaries of disciplines. I'm uh, a lot more for in disciplines, like uh, our friend Michele Cometa, uh, recently uh, wrote uh, in his last book on uh, visual culture. Not coincidentally, I, I established uh, uh, three years ago, together with the scholar of the humanities, Michele Guerra, who's a film theorist, a lab called Neuroscience and the Humanities. So I think what we desperately need is to know um, a lot more about uh, not disciplines, but our approaches our levels of description, our uh, uh, respective epistemologies. So we need more than a dialogue, we need a collaboration. And uh, in my very limited personal experience, this is exactly what I'm up to uh, uh, in the last 15 years. 
which means, uh, for example, in our Facebook page, uh, uh, the image of our Facebook page, uh, um, I choose uh, uh, a picture of uh, one of my heroes in the, in the humanities, which is Abi Warburg, not coincidentally uh, named as the founder of a science with no name. So uh, on this basis, I think that uh, uh, neuroscience is uh, uh, an approach to anthropology, to what does it mean to be humans that cannot be neglected. Uh, let me say more. I think it is necessary, but not sufficient. And uh, I think that we should very much stay clear uh, from a mythology of the brain as such. What is going on here is uh, determined, but what is going on in the remaining part of the body, in the environment and in the brain bodies of our fellow humans, of the animals, of the objects with which we interact. So, uh, that idea of uh, neurodeterminism stems from a misunderstanding uh, of what the brain really does. And I totally disagree with statements like uh, those you quoted from colleagues of mine. Uh, you quoted Ledoux, uh, I am my, my synapses. I am my synapses, I am my liver, I am my guts, I am my heart, I am my lungs, I am uh, my fellow humans with whom I relate. Uh, so um, I, I, I am fully aware that uh, a certain way to uh, use uh, uh, the neuroscientific uh, methodology can lead one to embrace uh, a deterministic, mechanistic, uh, uh, solipsistic stance uh, to humanity. What I would like to remark, and then I, I'll shut up because I, I have the chance to develop this uh, in two days, uh, in Naples, in presence, uh, uh, this is not the only game in town. And the, uh, the, the, the article from the French sociologist uh, on neural neurons sounded totally nonsensical. Mm. Uh, I mean, uh, when I uh, try to address a topic related to the humanities, I always do it uh, in close collaboration with scholars from the humanities. Uh, I did it with David Friedberg for art. I did it with Dana Bichowski, uh, who teaches English literature at Austin. I did it with uh, uh, Michele Guerra, uh, who teaches uh, film theory in Parma and the like. This sociologist probably knows nothing about mirror neurons. Yeah. Uh, he never read any uh, scientific paper. He barely may have uh, read uh, some uh, some. Um, some, some title of these papers. So this kind of dialogue, this uh, uh, attempt uh, to dissolve the barriers that make uh, dialogue and collaboration uh, uh, difficult require a lot of work, a lot of study, and not uh, many people are ready to do that. So for many of, of, of these people, both in, in the camp of neuroscience and or the biological sciences at large, and in the camp of the humanities, don't want to do their homework. So it's much easier and quicker uh, to say, ah, oh, we don't want to know about that. It doesn't offer any perspective for our work. And um, so the crisis of the humanities, uh, I think, um, should not be uh, accounted for because of the challenge of the neuroscience. You were quoting the Neuro Humanities Program at, at Duke. Uh, a friend of mine, uh, Michele Forte, who teaches uh, uh, archaeology at Duke, and uh, together with Deborah Jensen, was part of this program. This program is largely being dismantled. Uh, uh, to be honest, uh, I find very difficult uh, to convince people in the neuroscientific communities uh, of the relevance and the uh, importance, the crucial importance to collaborate uh, with scholars in the humanities. In the neuroscience, this is a very peripheral field. So the dangers for the humanities, at least this is my uh, very personal opinion, do not come uh, uh, from neuroscience at all. Thank you.
Yeah. Thank you very much, Vittorio. Um, in fact, we, we totally agree. I mean, um, I, I, I took on purpose examples of reductionist, very reductionist uh, approaches to, to neuroscience. And this was done on purpose because I wanted to set up the dialogue between, let's say, continental philosophy and, uh, uh, and cognitivist, f cognitive philosophy. And that's why I insisted upon uh, theories of consciousness. And undoubtedly uh, in France, I mean, uh, very reductive theories of consciousness are gaining power uh, day after day. For example, in the Collège de France, uh, I don't want to quote any proper names, but in the Collège de France, uh, the, the neuroscientists that are in charge of uh, pre prestigious chairs, etc., are very reductionist and they negate the existence of consciousness. They negate any kind of autonomy uh, in our um, in the construction of our life experience. It has consequences in art as well. Uh, for example, recently, someone at the Collège de France defended figurative painting over abstract painting because supposedly it was uh, uh, more harmonious and thus more assimilable by the brain. You know, things, stupid things like that. And I know that, of course, I've always made the difference and we talked about that already between people like you, people like Damasio, people, I mean, open-minded scientists and these very, very reductionist ones that who unfortunately are very influential uh, so uh, you, you're right that perhaps uh, the danger for the humanities don't come only from neuroscience, of course, of course, but it is a danger nevertheless. Uh, that, you know, this kind of very uh, primary theories on consciousness, on art, etc., are infiltrating, you know, the, the um, uh, cultural sciences, I mean, human sciences. Uh, and fortunately, there are people like you and others who um, are counterbalancing the, the landscape. But uh, there's a danger nevertheless, I think. So now it's the moment for Professor Montani. Yes, thank you. Uh, very quickly, thank you, Catherine, because we uh, we have uh, uh, not so uh, time for uh, the two or three questions I I have uh, to ask. But uh, one of these uh, I want to to ask you because. It's very interesting for me. Uh, I refer uh, to your book Before uh, Tomorrow, in which I was very impressed that your idea of Kant's critical philosophy as a combination of structural, transcendental, and evolutionary vision refers to the dialectic that Paul Ricoeur proposes between an archeological and a teleological dimension in identity formation. Recently, I have not found this reference in your work anymore. And I was wondering if you still consider it valid. From my point of view, it is a very useful reference because it allows us to interpret in a relevant way Freud's famous statement, you know, uh, wo es war soll ich werden. It's very difficult to translate more or less where it was, it the instinctual, the neuronal, the merely synaptical, uh, uh, so to say, only there where it was, only there can I reach myself, only there. 
can I reach myself? And that is in this way that the epigenesis of personal identity can be implemented only from something to which I am assigned a free and plastic epigenesis, but only from an already given. The same applies, I think, to the epigenesis of the reason, the practical one particularly. In other words, recurrent Freud seemed to me to be useful by posing the greed problem of the relationship between plasticity and the given condition, the principle of reality, the facticity of existence, the pre-individual to use uh, 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 an expression of Gilbert Simondon. It's, it, it is relevant, uh, uh, recare for your position and uh, Gilbert Simondon. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you very much, Pietro. This is beautiful. Um, yes, so in, in, um, just to resituate a little bit the discussion I, in my book on Kant uh, before tomorrow, yeah. I, I, I made use of uh, Paul Ricoeur's metaphor of epigenesis that he um, develops in his uh, hermeneutical theory. He says, what is interesting when we interpret something is to find the crossing point between, as Pietro said, an archaeological past, that is a, a, a long time gone past, and a goal, a telos. And that we have to situate ourselves at the, in the middle of archaeology and teleology, at the surface between these two moments of time, uh, past and future. And in epigenesis, you also have the uh, idea of a surface. So we don't have to deal, to dig, uh, deep in the earth in order to understand something. We just have to find a way to uh, find a synapse between the past and the future. And uh, it, it is where where it was, yeah. I will be. Huh? I so will be. I good. can, I can, and I have to do, but I don't know what it is. I don't know what it, it, it is. is totally, is totally free. Totally, exactly. totally, totally uh, out of uh, molding. Uh -huh. It is, uh, that's why it is hermeneutical for Ricoeur because it is an interpretation. I don't know what it is, so I have to interpret it. So yes, absolutely, I, 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 it is still totally valid. And my seminar after the Chicago one, I'll teach another one on Ricoeur, uh, on the book, oneself as another. Yeah. Because this is exactly yeah. what you said. So I, I can only agree and thank you for your question because you're totally right. This is enormous and this is something I want to explore um, soon by a reading of oneself as another. Because yeah. oneself as another, if you think of the title, yeah, 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 yeah. exactly is exactly what we're talking about. We are two persons. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, I, I saw on the chat that there was a question about free will, but yes. I think that we answered already. If I may, do you consider that we answered already? Seems to me that we said a lot of things about that. Um, so, uh, pa Sarah, Sarah's question yes. will read the end. Obviously, the fracture between the two fields, the humanities and the uh, sciences began far before the 20th century. But my question is, if there could be a sort of historical trauma from World War II and the Nazis, which had the last ideology that tried to put together disciplines, obviously in a totally false way, and there was a real catastrophe, could we humanities still feel guilty for that? If yes, how can we move from this sense of failure? Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this question. I think this is very important because it is true that biology has been used by Nazis as a, a leading science that had the power that would have, well, that supposedly had the power to infiltrate all other cultural domains. And that was a catastrophe, of course. But this helps many philosophers this, this is used by many philosophers as a pretext to reject 
any kind of biology, any kind of biological approach. I think of a philosopher, Italian philosopher like Agamben, for example, who systematically will assimilate biology with biologism. So I agree on the one hand, and you're totally right, that a biologization of, uh, of the human by the Nazi was absolutely catastrophic. But I think this is not a reason uh, to uh, systematically assimilate biology with uh, with genetic manipulations, um, ethnic purification, you see what I mean. Uh, I, I think it is too often used as an argument uh, against, um, against biology. So there are no further questions, I suppose. So I thank you very much for this. No, thank you, uh, um, it was very interesting. I thank you very much for your attention. And we have a lot of books uh, to read and all the suggestions. And we will see tomorrow at 4 p.m. with the lecture of Professor Montani with the introduction of Massimiliano Biscoso. So see you soon. Thank you very much. And I'm sorry that I have to, to travel so I can't hear you tomorrow, Pietro, I'm sorry. Bon voyage, bon voyage. Merci, merci, merci. Au revoir. Ciao. Ciao a tutti. A domani noi.